on Ulu Tiram Police Station shouldn't be taken lightly. Agricultural sector biogas stations should be increased. Hello, good evening and salam Malaysia Madani. Thanks for joining us. I'm Shuhaida Arifin and you're watching Malaysia Tonight. The early morning attack on the Ulu Tiram police station in Johor Bahru yesterday, which claimed the lives of two policemen, should not be taken lightly despite the country's overall peaceful state, as emphasized by Deputy Prime Minister Datuk Seri Dr. Ahmad Zaid Hamidi. He stated that the incident was totally isolated and the Royal Malaysia Police PDRM and National Security Council MKN should promptly take proactive measures to prevent sh such shocking occurrences. Jadi apa yang berlaku di Ulu Tiram ini, uh, tindakan uh, pantas uh, pihak polis ini amat dialu-alukan dan kita mahu menghapuskan 100% daripada uh, pengaruh uh, terorisme atau keganasan di negara kita. Dan uh, kita ucapkan takziah kepada dua uh, anggota polis yang uh, terkorban uh, dan seorang yang terjedera. Namun uh, saya merasakan... Uh, Pihak cawangan khas, khususnya bahagian anti keganasan, harus diucapkan tanya kerana mereka terus bergerak walaupun selama ini keadaan agak tenang. Met today, Datuk Seri Ahmad Zahid expressed confidence in Malaysia's status as one of the most peaceful nations as reflected in its peace index. He also urged the public not to marginalise former members of radical groups to prevent their re-engagement in unhealthy activities due to social isolation. In the attack that occurred at 2.45 a.m. yesterday, three people were confirmed dead, including two police personnel aged 24 and 22, as well as 21-year-old male suspect. Another policeman was injured and is reported to be in stable condition. A search at the suspect's house in Ulutiram led to the arrest of five members of his family aged 19 to 62. The suspect killed in the attack on the Ulutiram police station yesterday was believed to have acted alone. According to Home Minister Dato Suri Saifuddin Nasution Ismail, the action of the 21-year-old local man was not linked to a group, as was initially concluded by the police after 46 individuals were interviewed to facilitate the investigation. Penyerang ini uh, bertindak bersendirian. Ya, kita panggil lone wolf istilahnya ya. Of course dia driven by certain motivation yang dia faham lah sebab dia tak bercampur orang. Dia tak bercampur orang ya. Uh, dan kerana itu uh, kita boleh buat kesimpulan awal daripada uh, temu bual kita dengan individu yang kita panggil bahawa uh, establishment-nya uh, adalah tindakan itu berupa tindakan bersendirian ya, tindakan yang terpisah daripada satu Orang nak kata satu apa nama misi besar ataupun satu kumpulan terancang. He said this in a press conference at the Johor Police Contingent Headquarters in Johor Bahru today. Also present was Inspector General of Police Tan Sri Razaluddin Hussein. On a related note, seven individuals were remanded for seven days from today until 24th May to assist in the investigation into the attack on the Ulu Tiram police station. Magistrate Hidayatul Shuhada Samsudin allowed the remand application at the Suri Alam District Police Headquarters to facilitate investigations under Section 302 of the Penal Code. The individuals placed under remand included five members of the suspect's family, aged between 19 and 65 who were arrested following a search at the suspect's family's residence early yesterday morning. Also remanded are two college students aged 21 and 22, both locals, who were also at the scene of the incident. All suspects except a 65-year-old woman are represented by the National Legal Aid Foundation lawyers Muhammad Zahir Rosli, Bustama Menon, Abdul Hamid Menon and Sulaiman Zamani. The Madrid Court of Appeal has upheld the contempt of court conviction 
and sentence of arbitrator Gonzalo Stampa in the Sulu Clemens case against Malaysia. Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, Law and Institutional Reform, Dato Sri Azalina Uthman Said revealed that Malaysia was notified on Friday of the appellate court's decision to dismiss Stampa's appeal and uphold his six-month prison sentence and a one-year ban from practicing as an arbitrator. In its judgment, the Madrid Court of Appeal confirms that Stampa knowingly and willfully disobeyed the clear rulings and orders of the Madrid High Court of Justice, resulting from the nullification of his appointment as arbitrator. In December 2021, after the unprecedented change of arbitration seat from Spain to France, Malaysia, which has complete and unwavering confidence in the Spanish judicial system, filed a complaint against Stampa, which is Spain's public prosecutor, on the grounds that he had acted in contempt of court by repeatedly disobeying the orders of the Madrid High Court and continued to forum shopping in other jurisdictions. Tower operators and contractors urge to speed up operation. The number of biogas stations which have been built and are operating in this country, especially in the agricultural sector, should be increased to achieve the national goal of increasing renewable energy capacity to 31% by 2025. Deputy Prime Minister Dato Sri Dr. Mazed Hamidi said the exploration of renewable energy not only reduces the country's dependence on fossil fuels but also helps reduce the government's burden in the distribution of electricity subsidies. He said that the cost of borne by the government in terms of electricity subsidies was very high before as it was given to all groups equally and because of that, the targeted subsidies were introduced. He said this when officiating the 5.5 megawatt biogas power plant by Falkra Japutra Sendirian Berhad and Synergy C Berhad in Jurantut today. It was also attended by Pahang Menteri Besar, Datuk Seri Wan Rosdi Wan Ismail on the largest palm oil mill affluent biogas power plant project in Malaysia, which started full operations on 11th April, is capable of supplying electricity to nearly 14,000 homes or about 70,000 rural residents. It is the largest grid-connected biogas power plant in the country, which has been recognised by the Malaysia Book of Records. All agencies under the supervision of the Ministry of Entrepreneur Development and Cooperatives KUSCOP are urged to empower their respective digital banking operations, particularly involving artificial intelligence AI. Deputy Minister of Entrepreneur and Cooperative Development, Dato R. Ramanan, said it was in response to Prime Minister Dato Sri Anwar Ibrahim's call to expand the use of AI systems in the country. So, kalau kita tak uh, memajukan uh, diri kita, if we don't take this opportunity to move along with times, kita akan ketinggalan. Sebab negara-negara lain pun, dia orang tengah mengarah ke digital, uh, the digital world. So, kalau kita tidak mengambil uh, kesempatan ini dan mengambil masa ini untuk upgrade diri kita, untuk masuk ke digital banking, then we are going to be left back. Kita akan ketinggalan. He said this in a press conference after opening the 2024 annual general meeting of Bank Rakyat in the nation's capital today. Besides Bank Rakyat, other agencies under the ministry include SME Bank, the Kun Nasional, the Cooperative Institute of Malaysia and the Malaysian Cooperative Societies Commission. 902 delegates from all over the country attended the meeting today to give ideas towards bringing the banking institution to the next level. Sarawak is optimistic that its state revenue will continue to grow over the next two to three years, driven by the state's strong economic performance this year. Premier Tan Sri Abang Johari Tun Openg noted that Sarawak generated 4.798 billion ringgit in revenue in the first quarter of this year, indicating that the state is on the right path towards becoming a high-income state through the post-COVID-19 development strategy 2030. Abang Johari, who is also the Gadong State Assemblyman, attributed the growth to the state government's efforts to strengthen new economic sectors and explore technology and digitalizations across various fields. Uh, 
masa ini apa yang telah saya uh, lakukan kita ada rancangan jangka panjang melalui uh, post covid di luar negeri kala 2030 uh, dan sekarang ini adalah usaha untuk uh, melaksanakan apa yang telah dimasuk di dalam uh, strategi tersebut bermakna ia adalah something uh, yang dalam proses pelaksanaan Umpamanya untuk luar bandar, kita bangunkan uh, infrastruktur yang asas Tegalan api, tegalan air, jalan raya, jembatan Untuk so, yang ini, telekomunikasi, yang ini penting He said this during a town hall session on the Sarawak budget discussion at the PAUM Clubhouse, University Malaya UM, in Kuala Lumpur today. Over 400 Sarawakian students from 12 public universities in Peninsular Malaysia were in attendance. Contractors and operators at telecommunication towers are today told to communicate and cooperate to immediately overcome problems, thus speeding up the facility's operation. Communications Minister Fami Fadil said both parties should work together to coordinate the operation of a telecommunication tower at least three or four months before the facility is ready to enable the people to enjoy better telecommunication. He said all the parties involved have informed him that by the end of the year, almost 400 towers in Sabah will be completed. But after inspecting the operation of the telecommunication tower under Phase 1 of the National Digital Network Plan Jendela project in Kampung Manga Tawau today, Fami said the Communications Ministry and the Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission MCMC will monitor the progress of the project to ensure it is completed and run smoothly. Mungkin ada sejumlah menara, kita perlu ada penyesuaian teknologi dan sama juga kalau kita pergi ke kawasan-kawasan yang berhampiran, pulau-pulau, ada mungkin kita kena guna satelit, mungkin kita kena guna, kena guna beberapa teknologi yang lain, tapi secara keseluruhan komitmen kita adalah untuk menyelesaikan masalah internet. The ministry, he said, planned to build 647 new towers, upgrade 4,486 existing transmitting stations and install 303,569 premises with fibre optic connections in Sabah. He also said a total of 259 transmitter stations have been upgraded and a total of 18,231 premises installed with fibre optic connections. He said the broadband service through the Satellite Broadband Wireless Access, BWA, will be provided in 138 locations in the interior areas. QNAT, a global wellness and lifestyle-focused direct selling company, this week celebrated 26 years of impact and legacy as it looks forward to deepening its footprints of positivity across the world. The company's founders, Datuk Suri Vijay Swaran and Joseph Bismarck, noted the first 25 years of QNAT celebrated last year positively touched the lives of millions of people across the world. The 26th edition of its popular global conference called the VCon took place in the Spice Arena in Pulau Pinang between the 12th and 16th May under the theme Unstoppable. It was attended by delegates from different parts of the world, including from West African countries such as Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal and Burkina Faso. VCon 2024 also witnessed the release of new QNET products such as the Home Pure Rain, Showerheads and Mescua E-Guard, which provides protection from electronic devices. Since its inception 26 years ago, the company has operated a unique business model that allowed the public to start their businesses and earn an income by selling the company's products. Action by Bank Negara Malaysia BNM and the government to promote consistent inflows into the foreign exchange market has eased the pressure on the ringgit against the US dollar. Governor Dato' Sheikh Abdul Rashid Abdul Ghafur said this was evidenced by the local currency appreciating 1.6% against the greenback between 26 February and 15 May this year. 
Prior to the implementation of the coordinated measures on 26 February, Dato' Sheikh said the ringgit had fallen by 3.9% against the US dollar. He reiterated that the government and BNM had taken coordinated actions to encourage consistent flows into the forex market, such as encouraging repatriation and conversion of foreign investment income by government-linked companies and government-linked investment companies. BNM also encouraged corporates and exporters to convert their export proceeds and foreign investments income and monitor conversion of export proceeds and import payments. Meanwhile, it was reported that the crude palm oil CPO futures contract on Bursa Malaysia derivatives is expected to trade sideways with a bearish bias next week, ranging from 3,800 to 3,950 ringgit a ton. This is due to the expectation of weak exports and higher production in the coming weeks. For the trading week just ended, substantial buying support from India and China bolstered market sentiment for palm oil. The recent gains in rivals soybean oil also supported palm oil. On a weekly basis, the spot month June 2024 contract strengthened 52 ringgit to 3,895 ringgit a ton and July 2024 ended 85 ringgit to 3,894 ringgit a ton. While August 2024 and September 2024 were each 91 ringgit firmer at 3,892 ringgit a ton and 3,895 ringgit a ton respectively. Total weekly volume increased to 331,614 lots from 314,352 lots in the previous week, while open interest fell to 2,004. 204,710 contracts from 220,693 contracts a week ago. Up next in the foreign segment, at least 50 killed in heavy rain floods in central Afghanistan. Heavy clashes and bombardment today rocked Gaza's southern city of Rafah as it was reported that the first 310 pallets of humanitarian aid had entered the besieged territory via a U.S.-built pier. More than 10 days into what Israeli occupation forces called a limited operations in Rafah, fighting between Israeli forces and Palestinians has also fled again in Gaza's north. The Kuwaiti hospital said an overnight Israeli strike killed at least two people in a displacement camp in Rafah, with witnesses reporting heavy gunfire and shelling in the city's southeast and jets bombarding in eastern areas. The Israeli incursion into Rafah launched despite overwhelming international opposition and as mediators were hoping for a breakthrough in stalled truce talks, has worsened an already dire humanitarian crisis. In the coming days, around 500 tons of aid are expected to be delivered to Gaza through the flooding pier constructed by the United States. But UN agencies and humanitarian aid groups have warned that the so-called maritime corridor and ongoing airdrops from planes cannot replace far more efficient truck convoys into Gaza, where the United Nations has repeatedly warned of looming famine. At least 50 people have been killed and thousands of homes destroyed following a new bout of heavy rains and flooding in central Afghanistan. Flash floods caused by torrential seasonal rains have for four weeks devastated a wide swathe of territory across Afghanistan, killing hundreds of people, leaving thousands injured and destroying homes and communities. Police spokesman Abdurrahman Badri today said he expected the number of casualties to rise. He added that the floods also killed thousands of cattle, destroyed hundreds of hectares of agricultural land, hundreds of bridges and culverts, and destroyed thousands of trees. According to preliminary reports, Abdul Wahid Hamas, spokesman for Gore's provincial governor, said dozens of people were also missing. Maulawi Abdul Hai Zaim, head of the Information Department for Gore, said the latest wet spell began on Friday, cutting off many key roads to the area. He said that 2,000 houses were completely destroyed, 4,000 partially damaged, and more than 2,000 shops were underwater in the province capital, Firozko. 
Taiwan's president-elect Lai ching te a staunch defender of the island's democracy, will be sworn into office on Monday as Beijing ratchets up military and diplomatic pressure on Taipei. China, which claims Taiwan as part of its territory, has branded Lai a dangerous separatist who will bring war and decline to the self-rule island. Lai will succeed President Tsai Ing-wen in a ceremony that will be closely watched by China and the United States, the island's key partner and weapons provider. Beijing has intensified military and diplomatic pressure on Taiwan during Tsai's eight years in power over her Democratic Progressive Party's DPP rejection of China's claims on the island. Lai, who hails from the same party, has previously described himself as a pragmatic worker for independence. In recent years, Lai and the DPP have toned down past rhetoric, pushing for formal independence, arguing that since Taiwan is already self-ruled, there's no need for a declaration that would enrage Beijing. Given the high stakes, Lai is expected to maintain the responsible policies of his predecessor. Lai recently has made repeated overtures to Beijing, indicating a wish for a resumption of high-level communications, which China severed after Chai took office. Sports, Pandalela and Dabita absence from Olympics, a wake-up call. The Ministry of Youth and Sports KBS aims to ensure that the talent search and development programs continue at the state level, particularly for sports that have the potential to win medals on the international stage. Minister Henayo said the sports such as cycling and swimming are among those that have shined at the Olympics, Commonwealth Games and Asian Games, but these sports require new talents to maintain their continuity. Additionally, Hannah also urged all state governments to allocate sufficient funds for their sports portfolios to support sports development and talent search. I think it's a wake up call. Um, bila Pandalela dengan Dapita tidak dapat pergi ke Olympic, sukan ini is very simple formula. You invest into a sport, you will see the outcome. Okay, but we cannot always just depend on Pandalila and Dabita. And it's just like last time, always just kita depend Lee Chong Wei, Nicole, Dabita, Pandalila. Tapi kita kena hasilkan atlet baru. So we cannot just over depend on a few athletes to get us the pingat. Yeah. Pencarian bakat sangat penting. So that's why I say the negeri-negeri, MB, MB semua kena laburkan duit dalam portfolio sukan. Al-Hilal kept its unbeaten streak in the Saudi Pro League 2023-2024 alive after Alexander Mitrovic converted a penalty to make it one all in the dying moments of its match against al Nasser at the Al-Awwal Stadium early this morning. al Nasser took the lead in the first minute after Cristiano Ronaldo set up Otavio at the edge of the penalty area. Otavio smashed the ball into the top right corner past a helpless Yasin Bonu to give his side the lead 25 seconds into the match. The 39-year-old Portuguese talisman then missed three easy chances to extend Al Nasser's lead in the first half, which ended up haunting his side in the end. Al Hilal found his usual form in the second half but could not convert the chances. Goalkeeper Bonu kept his side in the tie, making a couple of fantastic saves in the closing stages of the match. With the clock running out, Al Hilal finally got its opportunity to equalize when it was awarded a penalty after Sadio Mane caught Saud Abdul Hamid in the face on the right side of the penalty box five minutes into injury time. After a long VAR check, the referee pointed to the spot and Mitrovic made no mistake in dispatching the ball into the goal, extending his side's unbeaten run in the league to 32 games. Feyenoord coach Anslot confirmed on Friday that he would take the Liverpool job next season after Jurgen Klopp leaves the Premier League club at the end of the campaign. Feyenoord confirmed Slot's departure, posting a video on X saying the Anslot era is coming to an end. 
Liverpool have not yet confirmed Klopp's replacement, but with the German manager leaving after the club's final game of the season against Wolverhampton Wanderers on Sunday. Slot has been in charge of the Dutch club since 2021 and won the Eredivisie League title in 2022-2023 along with the KNVB Cup this season. Feyenoord also reached the Europa Conference League final in his first season at the club. Klopp announced in January that he would leave Liverpool at the end of the season. Although Bayern Leverkusen boss Xabi Alonso and sporting Lipson coach Ruben Amorin were previously linked with the job, the 45-year-old Slot is set to take charge. Slot had signed a contract extension with Feyenoord at the end of the last season until 2026, with media reports saying Liverpool needed to pay the Dutch club an undisclosed sum for his signature. All right, now move on to cycling. Jonathan Milan of LIDL Track maintained his excellent form at the Giro d'Italia to win stage 13 on Friday, marking the Italian's third stage victory. His team worked perfectly, leading him out into the last kilometre, and Milan was well placed in seconds as they rounded the final band, but it looked like Fernando Gaviria would steal the win as he took to the front. Milan, however, showed just why he is the points classification leader as he pounds to take another stage victory with Poland's Stanislaw Aniolokowski from Confidus finishing strongly in second and Bahrain victorious Phil Bauhaus third. The 179-kilometre ride from Region to Cento was the flattest stage of the Giro. An early break by the three Italian riders Andrea Pietrobon, Manuele Tarosi and Alessandro Tonelli managed to gain a three-minute advantage before the peloton upped the pace to reel them in with over 50 kilometres still to race. The peloton then dropped a large group of riders, including Milan, and the Italian had to use up plenty of energy playing catch up but he still had the legs at the finish for another win after previously taking stages 4 and 11. Tadej Pogacar maintained his firm grip on the leader's jersey and is still 2 minutes and 40 seconds ahead of Daniel Philip Martinez with Geraint Thomas 16 seconds further behind in third. All right, so that concludes this edition of Malaysia Tonight. In our top story, attack on Ulu Teram police station shouldn't be taken lightly. To that, I'm Shuhaida Arifin. From river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you for watching.